uh, how does the autoimmune theory fit with uh, MAP infection theory? Very well. Um, very well. Autoimmune causality for Crohn's is dead. Simple as that. Um, you just um, need one Martian to prove there is life on Mars. And if we have patients who have been treated with immune-modifying medications and they fail treatment, like the one published by Will Chamberlain, and then you simply add on antibiotics and the Crohn's goes away, uh, that one simple case is needed to disprove a theory. And it's the, to prove a theory, it's best to try and disprove it with a single case, that's all you need. Um, the autoimmune theory is rooted in the 60s, and that is in a situation where the uh, infectious diseases theory had not gained a foothold. It was stating that it's an, uh, a reaction to our own indigenous flora, and by some miracle, a person suddenly developed inflammation when they've had these bacteria all along. Uh, one of the greatest pieces of evidence against the so-called autoimmune theory is that if you have patients who have simply Crohn's of the duodenum and nothing in a colon where all the bugs are to which it's supposed to react, then it just shows you that scientists like this need to read again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, what about the recent paper published in Gastroenterology uh, talking about the TH2 response? Uh, I'm not sure if I know what I'm what yeah, you're referring to. The Clancy. That was done here. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, there are immunological studies that, that measure various cytokines. I think the more important paper by Clancy and Ren and Gerald Pang is that TNF alpha is released into the circulation from cells infected with MAP. And when, you, when we treated the patients with MAP, the TNF alpha fell. So it just puts together an extra piece in the puzzle uh, indicating that the immune stimulation to TNF alpha release is actually caused by the infecting agent. One of the conclusions or uh, inferences they drew was that it would fit with the hygiene hypothesis seeing this. Right, I mean it's a very broad stroke hygiene hypothesis that the more infected we are with various other uh, housing more bugs that we're less likely to develop disease. That's a whole new area and it's kind of soft data. The hygiene hypothesis. Yeah. Uh, I mean it's probably probably there but you know you can't test it very well in humans. You can probably do this in animals better. It probably has been, I haven't read it. Um, how, how would the map hypothesis fit with other prominent theories on the pathogenesis in those four uh, cited by Dr. Sartor, uh, one being that there's a dysbiosis, the commensal microbiota, uh, there's host genetic defects in containing the flora, and there is uh, defective host immune regulation. I think the defective host immune regulation is probably the underlying basis, and there are various genetic markers like nod 2 card 15 genes, which um, which tell us that the, that person is not able to handle MAP infection or possibly other intracellular infections. Uh, the other theories are all poured into the reaction to our own flora theory. And um, I think the paper by Sato which quotes these is essentially attempting to, uh, to try and explain away the, the basic belief that we have and we're trying to prove it. Uh, this is the autoimmune aspect of it. And uh, because it, it runs into the hands of the autoimmune concept, uh, we have to shut the case on that one as well. Uh, if, if, um, if we did have diseases that were responding to our own flora and there being a dysbiosis, uh, the most obvious, um, most obvious example here is that wherever the tissue touches that, um, that dysbiotic bacterium, there should be inflammation. And we just simply have to look at colitis, which is just distal, or Crohn's, which is patchy, that this is not true. Uh, whereas if the body develops an allergic reaction, for example, to, to 
to nickel. You're going to have nickel inflammation around where you might be wearing a ring or a bracelet around your neck. But there are no areas where nickel will contact you and you're not going to get a reaction. And the same thing is with the autoimmune theory. If you are having a reaction to the bugs in your stool, then you're going to have a reaction everywhere. But these bugs aren't just having uh, individual little island reaction parties on their own. No, they're, they're, they're generalized. Not, they're, not, they're not in one area in no, the bowel, and that's not explained. No. Now, that would be nice, you know, if you could then say um, it's, um, that this biosis is occurring just in the rectum. Quite a few people have rectal inflammation and peri uh, appendiceal inflammation, for example, and yet there is no regionality. There are broad regional changes, but there is no regionality to, to, to all the flora. What you sample in one side, you sample in the other. And the differences in, in the bacterial concentrations may well have affected by the transit and antibiotic usage, and especially anti-inflammatory agents, which we now know are antibiotics. Um, is a MAP infection sort of like another classical infection? Is, how does MAP infection in the intestine compare to uh, intestinal TB, for instance? It's very similar to intestinal TB and heals in a similar fashion, except that tuberculosis uh, ends up with, uh, with caseating granulomas, where there is like a cheese-like structure in the center, whereas Mycobacterium avium does not cause caseation. It just causes an accumulation of white cells that, that surround the foreign body reaction, which is a classic granuloma. So it has features of, but also uh, dissimilarity to tuberculosis. And in fact, there are no exactly parallel infections, but there are similarities between infections because of the host parasite relationship differences and because differences in bugs, the way they're built, the toxins they produce, their ability to penetrate cells. Tuberculosis TB, for example, is largely extracellular, whereas M. avium um, paratuberculosis infection is largely intracellular, and it creates its own model. That, that sort of distinction might be um, an explanation or, or that brings you into the topic of the anti-TNF-alpha drugs and how the TB is extracellular and um, the MAP is intracellular, and some, some criticize the MAP hypothesis by saying that, well, if it is MAP, then why do patients get, get well yeah, on, why don't patients on the develop TNF disseminated alpha? MAP, right? Yeah, when, when they <coughs> will, if, if you know, it reactivates TB, why would it not reactivate MAP? Yeah, and, and that, that's again a question that's been posed by people who don't know much about microbiology, because you can simply uh, answer like this, why don't you get disseminated helicobacter? When a large number of these patients have helicobacter, why not? It's intracellular and extracellular. Well, why not? It's not the nature of the beast. Mycobacterium leprae, when you use TNF-alpha inhibitors, does not disseminate either, although it grows possibly a little bit faster. So Mycobacterium avium paratuberculosis is incapable of disseminating. Okay. So anti-TNF may be increasing its growth, no one's ever measured it, in fact it could be making Crohn's worse when you stop the anti-TNF, but only tuberculosis with only one or two other infectious have the diseases, have the ability of being miliary. TB is capable of doing that, so if you slice a lung or a liver, you have like millet seeds and the patient is dying from disseminated TB. Well, Mycobacterium avium paratuberculosis does not have a miliary phase. It can't do it. It's incapable because it's always interested in it. So that argument falls flat on its face by someone who's asked the question who had no idea the question to ask. Yeah. So a lesson from one mycobacteria does not uh, always apply to another? No, they behave differently. And yet we use immunosuppressants in other mycobacterial infections, such as leprosy. And I used to have a leprosorium, and I used to treat a lot of lepers. And what we did we used to do, we used steroids, we used Imuran to stop the destructive leprosy because it causes nerve damage. So you don't just use antimycobacterial agents in leprosy, you use immunosuppressants, otherwise patients lose their nerves. Fingers drop off.